Well, in 2012, we kind of had an interesting chapel. Um, I got the idea of what it would be like to get um, the gospel writers together in a conference room answering questions about how they came to write, the structure of their gospel uh, account, and uh, just what it would be like to get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in a room talking about the process of writing the Gospels. So I kind of wrote out a script, uh, recruited four students. We got together for several lunches and walked through the script. Um, and uh, we had a chapel in which uh, the questions were something like this. What is your advice on how we should read the Gospels? What do you mean when you say the, the theme of creation runs through your, your gospel? Why do sincere Bible readers miss the unique structural shape of the gospels? Is there a discernible structure in your gospel? It was, just, uh, it was a fun exercise. It was well received, I think. The students really did a great job, the four that uh, represented the, the gospel writers. Each book makes, I think, a unique contribution to the Gospel Quartet. And Irenaeus picked up on that, and he wrote, and you probably have read him on this, the Gospels could not possibly be either more or less in number than they are. Since there are four zones of the world in which we live, and four principal winds while the church is spread over all the earth and the pillar and foundation of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life is fittingly has four pillars, everywhere breathing out incorporation and revivifying men, from this it's clear that the word, the artificer of all things being manifest to men gave us the gospel fourfold in form, but held together by one spirit and then Irenaeus picked up on the description of the cherubim in Revelation 4 about the, the lion being like John, the ox like Luke, the human face like Matthew, the eagle like Mark. Now it's interesting, Jerome changed them. So they weren't too uh, solidified. Jerome found, felt that the lion was better represented by Mark and the eagle by John. At Central Presbyterian Church uh, in New York, there's a cross behind the altar. And on that cross are the four figures at the corner of each of the crosses, at each of the, the bars on the cross. The lion representing John and Irenaeus's mind because of the royalty the word that was made flesh, the ox for Luke because of the sacrifices, the human lineage and thus Matthew, and the eagle for Mark because of the quote from Isaiah 40 in the first chapter. All of that to say that they saw a canonical shape to the Gospels. The Gospels are part and parcel representing the, uh, the Old Testament and giving voice in this beautiful kind of quartet of meaning. Uh, Jason Harris, the pastor now at Central Presbyterian, preached this an Advent series on the four weeks of Advent, taking each gospel account as uh, an introduction to Christ. And on John, he had a three-part sermon, a secretive person, because John doesn't identify himself in the gospel. He's the beloved disciple. He's there. He writes himself into the script, but he himself never says that it's him, the author. A soaring perspective and a stated purpose. Now, what's the stated purpose of the gospel of John? John 20, 31, 30. Um, these things have been written that you might believe. I think that's, you know, I think in every biblical text, 
there is a kind of DNA, a kind of essence to that biblical text. And I think we preach the parts of the text from the meaning of the whole. And so John's gospel, and this is a reason why so many people start with John's gospel, which in one sense, the, the poet, prophet, pastor John, who in a sense is, is maybe the most creative and imaginative of the gospel writers, and yet that's the, where we often begin, which is kind of ironic. Um, having studied the book of Revelation, uh, I kind of feel it's really the same guy. And, you know, there's no parables in the Gospel of John. But uh, there are plenty of parables in the Apocalypse. And it's almost like he left the earthy parables to the synoptic writers, and he used the cosmic parables for the book of Revelation. But uh, there's a lot of creativity going on, and we start with John. Uh, B, on your outline, each part of the fourth gospel is best understood in light of the whole. And the prologue. Have you ever gone back to your elementary school, walked the halls? What's your impression? It shrunk. And it can't use sort of plays off of that. One of the commentaries that uh, I use uh, for the gospel, Kent Hughes reminds us that each time the serious student returns to the gospel of John, his or her view of Christ will be a little bigger. Something like Lucy's experience with the lion Aslan. As she again gazed into his large, wise face, he said, welcome, child. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That's because you're older, little one, answered he. Not because you are, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. I think every time you come back to the Gospel of John, you find it bigger. And, uh, you know, one of the ways, one of our great concerns is that we not present the Gospel of John in kind of an innocuous way, a way that doesn't penetrate the heart and mind, um, the, uh, just the way he begins, calling the prologue to the Gospel of John an introduction, you know, just doesn't seem right. It's an overture. I mean, you're supposed to hear music when John uh, begins the way he does. Despite its simplicity of language, the prologue is far from simple. It takes the full story of the incarnate logos to get the, at the meaning of life captured in that burst of theology. It's a cosmic beginning. You right away think of Genesis and the tie-in between Creation Week and Redemption Week. Beasley Murray, see on your outline, and the employment of the Logos concept in the prologue to the fourth gospel is the supreme example within Christian history of the communication of the gospel in terms understood and appreciated by the nations. He sees the Logos principle as something that Paul picks up on in Mars Hill, that which you worship you do not know I now proclaim, so the evangelist sets forth to the world of his day, thoughts familiar to all about the Logos in relation to God and the world, startlingly modified by the affirmation of the Incarnation, and then went on in the Gospel to tell how the Word acted in the words and deeds of Jesus and brought about the redemption of the nations. Why do you think in the prologue, with the introduction of Jesus, the living Word, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why mess it up with John the Baptist? Why put these two side by side? It's almost like you've got poetry and then historical function. Why put these two side by side? I think... And we could spend, and if we were in class, we would do that. We would spend some time on this, and then we'd hear, I'd hear from you. Uh, I think it's because, one, John is sort of handing the baton 
of the Old Testament revelation, the last prophet and the first witness. He's handing that off to the, the living word, the Lamb of God. And so there's a kind of a, a, an intertestamental witness in that first chapter of, of John. I also think it's designed to clearly show that there's a difference between the prophet and the Messiah. John is your culminating last prophet of the Old Testament, and it's clear that Jesus is not John, and John is not Jesus in the introduction of the Messiah. A number two on your outline, John parallels creation week with redemption week. Jesus' first week of ministry has a parallel to the Genesis creation week. I'm suggesting. Uh, you know, this is, it's really interesting. In a, in a New Testament Gospel of John course, you'd have to reason this out and prove it to the students that this is true, that you can make a case for Jesus' first week of public ministry is parallel to Genesis 1 and the creation. When you preach it, you don't have to worry about proving it. You can just proclaim it. You can say there's a parallel here between creation week and redemption week. That's one reason why I like the freedom of the church and the freedom of the pulpit. I'm convinced it's true that it was in John's mind, that parallel. Day one begins with, and I outline it there, we'll move it through quickly. Day one begins with John the Baptist's proclamation, I'm the voice of one calling, just like the voice of God calling creation into existence, John the Baptist is calling forth revelation into existence. Day two, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Day three, Andrew with another disciple spends the day with Jesus, just like Adam and Eve experienced with God in the Garden of Eden. Day four, Andrew finds his brother Peter, testifies, we found the Messiah. Day five and six, they walk to Galilee. And what is happening on day seven? A wedding. A wedding that prefigures the marriage supper of the Lamb. A wedding Genesis 2.24, Adam and Eve. There's an interesting parallel there that, uh, that speaks of the, the union of the canon um, and the fulfillment of God's revelation. Uh, I preached on the John 2 wedding at Cana, oh, about three weeks ago on a Thursday night even song at the Advent. And I, the title of my meditation was More Than a Guest. If you remember that the, um, the chief host of the wedding celebration never knew that Jesus had turned the water to wine, as far as he was concerned, Jesus was a guest. Only the disciples knew. And what was the impact of them knowing? They believed in him. And I think the whole Gospel of John is designed to make believers out of us. Uh, Bradley Cooper was being interviewed by Stephen Colbert about a week ago on this movie, A Star is Born. I haven't seen the movie, but it was a great interview. And Colbert was just going off on how great the movie was, is. And uh, Bradley Cooper said, well, we set out to make an epic movie by telling intimate stories. An epic movie by telling intimate, an intimate story. And isn't that what the gospel is? An epic gospel, but it always comes right down to earth. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. Jesus is talking to the blind man. It's, always, it's this epic gospel brought down to earth in a way that we can identify with, we can see in our praying imaginations. 
So we're at number three. I'm kind of moving rapidly because I'm watching the clock. John uses a theological literary weave to knit his gospel together. You know, sometimes our preaching probably would benefit if we had a, an English lit professor talk to us about the text. Because there's a literary as well as linguistic dimension to interpreting the Word of God. And, and the theological literariness of the Gospel of John is really evident. A book of seven signs. I list those there. Obviously, in John's mind, this was part of the knitting together of the gospel narrative, references to seven signs. B, because I, I list these there, so you, uh, they're in your outline. The seven I am sayings. Again, a way of knitting the whole narrative together. I am the bread of life, concluding with I am the true vine. And the hour sayings. Jesus refers to the hour 14 times. The narrator refers to it three times. Beginning with the wedding feast in Cana, my hour has not yet come, spoken to Mary, his mother, and concluding in 17.1, Father, the hour is come. And then D, the book of passions. And Richard Hayes, in reading scripture backwards, um, emphasizes this notion that and makes you aware of the constant references to Moses, multiple references to Moses, to Abraham, to uh, the allusions to the Old Testament, not the direct quotes, but an understanding that the, and I think this is true on all the gospel writers, they're really Old Testament preachers. And they are proclaiming the Old Testament in the light of the incarnate one, the living word. And so the Book of Passions proves that the Passion story is not an unforeseen disaster, but it was foreordained and played out in fulfillment of God's will with Jesus' full knowledge and participation. Number four, Jesus uses contrasting parallel encounters. Now, I think this, this is the epic gospel with intimate stories idea. Have you ever preached a sermon putting together Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. Now immediately you kind of think, well, that's way too much text. But I'm kind of into big sections of text because I think, one, I think that in the oral presentation of the gospel that John intended, he expected this to be put together. And if you look on your outline, I think Dale Bruner did most of this. You see the, the division, the parallel synergy between these two encounters, man and woman, urban, rural, under the cover of night, at high noon, uninterrupted conversation at night, no desire for con conversation at noon. Nicodemus is polite, respectful. The Samaritan woman is wary. An extraordinary professional person, an ordinary lay person, ruler of the Jews, marginal person in Sychar, Pharisee, the first thing said about him, promiscuous, we have to find that out, secure in himself, vulnerable in herself, the standard of morality, the like, likewise for immorality. You see, I mean, that's an interesting dynamic of parallel between these two. You know, you preach that, and you've pretty much covered everybody in the room, from the religious to the secular. And I think, you know, I think we could do that. It would take something. It'd be some sweat and tears to pull that off, but I think it's doable. I've done it. I don't know if I did it well, but I did it. The lame man and Jewish leaders, you just run right through the gospel account and you have this tension that's built in with different people with Jesus in the middle or responding to Jesus. One of those great texts, uh, I, yeah, I mean, aren't they all great texts, but John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. 
uh, that, you know, it ends, it begins with a crowd, and it ends with the 12. And the climax comes when Jesus turns to the disciples and says, do you want to leave too? And you know, you trace the intensification of the gospel message through that chapter that begins with compassion rather than a performance. And then each stage, Jesus takes it deeper and deeper until he says, unless you eat this body and drink this blood, you have no life in you. And the disciple, that's a bridge too far. The metaphor is breaking on unbelief at this point. And he turns to the disciples, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, where else do we have to go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Climax. But you kind of have to go from the crowd to the twelve. You kind of have to go through the intensification of the message and the reaction of the people. I think literarily and theologically, you kind of have to do that. You have to bring both together. Uh, we've heard a lot this week about pericopes. Um, a lot depends on how you select your pericope, how you do your textual selection. I, for one, believe that it's pretty important that it be long enough to include our fallenness and God's redemptive provision. And that the tension in the text is between that fallenness and God's provision. And that leads to the passion of the passage. So, for example, you can't take Jonah 4 and, and preach the first few verses on anger. You got to take all of Jonah 4. Because it's God's merciful response to Jonah's anger that has to be included in the message in order to get the fullness of the gospel. You know, I've heard the first part of Jonah preached on road rage and anger and all of that, and just ignoring what God said in response to Jonah. Well, I try to draw these various kind of encounters out Number four, John weaves narrative and discourse together. The feeding of the 5,000 and the bread of... I just talked about that, didn't I? The upper room discourse, John 13 through 17. Now, that, um, that produced three Lenten studies for me. Uh, three years of working to write 40 meditations you know, that Lent is 40 days plus seven Sundays. Every Sunday in the church is Resurrection Sunday. But those 40 days, uh, I prepared a devotional beginning in John 13. And I just came, I think I fell in love with Jesus' graduate school of discipleship. <laughs> because that's what that upper room discourse, I think, is. It's just a wonderful and powerful way of drawing out what is expected, what is reflected in the life of a disciple, and how Jesus ministers to that. Um, and so, John 13, I emphasize the God who kneels. And I think the beginning part of John 13 underscores the fact that this is all about the atonement. You know, my hour has come. And sort of the complete understanding of the cross is introduced at the beginning of John 13, but there's a kind of continuum between foot washing and crucifixion. But all are covered under the reality of the cruciform life. And then the second part with John 14 through 15, uh, the God who comforts. And uh, I, I've become more uh, convinced of the fact that God's comfort is rooted in several very key truths. Uh, and I gave it, if I can remember it right now, I didn't put them down. Uh, I gave him four Ps. I'm usually not into alliteration, but uh, with John 14 beginning uh, with the parousia, uh, 
the second coming of Christ, the giving of the Spirit, the paraclete, and the passion, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, and then John 15, the abiding presence. So the parousia, the passion, the paraclete, and the presence. And I think our comfort that we give to one another has got to be rooted in those four. Those don't lend themselves to Hallmark cards, necessarily, but those are the fundamental truthful realities that allow for us to be comforted by God because of what God has done. So the God who kneels, the God who comforts, and the God who prays. Uh, and in that uh, concluding Lenten study, which majored on John 17, I also included the prayers of the cross uh, from all the, the Gospels. Um, but it's an interesting unit from John 13 to 17. Um, where am I? Number C on your outline. John's Gospel calls for a retrospective rereading of Israel's Scripture, a reading backwards that reinterprets Scripture in the light of a new revelation imparted by Jesus and focused on the person of Jesus himself. This is Hayes, Richard Hayes. Richard Hayes sees little difference between Luke 24, 27, that famous passage, and John 5, 46. I'm going to read Hayes. I think Hayes is really important and has done a great service to us. Um, it's not something new. I think it's a reminder to us. The identity of Jesus is deeply embedded in Israel's texts and traditions, especially the traditions centered on the temple and Israel's annual feast. This is the wor world in which John's imagination is immersed. It's impossible to understand John's Jesus apart from the story of Israel and the liturgical festivals and symbols that recall and represent that story. It is not accurate then to say that Jesus nullifies or replaces Israel's Torah and Israel's worship life. Rather, he assumes and transforms them. Thus, even more comprehensively than the other Gospels, John understands the Old Testament as a vast matrix of symbols pointing to Jesus. The word, wisdom, temple, Sabbath, Passover, bread, shepherd. All scripture is actually bears witness to Jesus. And John understands the scripture as a huge web of signifiers generated by the pre-temporal eternal logos as intimations of his truth and glory. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me. So, D, I'm suggesting here a sermon series. Okay, it's a lot of weeks. I get that. But, and it's on the theme of God makes a believer out of me. Now, you have to understand, I think, that belief is not simply a verbal confession that this is true. That's not how John understands belief. John understands belief as the reality that transforms everything about me. This is why preaching the Gospel of John has tremendous edificational value and evangelistic value at the same time because of the meaning of belief. So you're preaching to mature believers who not only need a reminder, but need the truth. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that every text should be preached in such a way as you can end at the table. Regardless of your traditions, every, pre every message, I think, should be able to end at the table. That it's not what you have done for God, obviously, but what Christ has done for you, what God and the Spirit uh, have done. So here's some suggestions. I'll run through those, and then we'll have questions. Number one, God makes a believer in Jesus out of John the Baptist. It's just interesting to sort of look at that and the process of coming to conviction on John's part and then kind of going forward and then retreating back. You know, are you really the one? That type of thing. Number two, Jesus makes believers out of the disciples. 
that wedding feast in Cana. Number three, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the covenant promises of God. Uh, the cleansing of the temple right up front, right at the beginning. Now, you know, when I was in high school, that bothered me from an inerrantist standpoint. Which is it? How can it be both? Were there two temple cleansings? I wrestled with that. That was hard for me to kind of get over. Um, I didn't understand then the freedom of the apostles, of the gospel writers, to craft the message in a way that had Holy Spirit impact, Holy Spirit inspiration. And they were able to shape that. They weren't concerned about chronology in that particular instance. And that's OK. That's not an error. That's truth. Brought home to bear at the very beginning. I think there's one temple cleansing. It came at the end. I think John wanted to pull it right in so that we'd all know what he was doing from the outset. Number four, Jesus makes believers out of the religious and the irreligious. That's that parallel between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. The testimony of Jesus makes true believers with emphasis on John 5, 39 through 40. If you'd believe Moses, you'd believe me. Six, transforming admirers into believers. That passage on the feeding of the 5,000 going from meeting a compassionate physical need to meeting the deep spirit seated spiritual need. Number seven, Jesus attacks the religious obstacles to belief with emphasis on John 7, 24. Number eight, Jesus makes believers the true children of Abraham by fulfilling the Old Testament promises with emphasis on John 8, 58. I don't need to keep reading these to you, do I? You got it. Jesus can make believers out of us and the fullness of the understanding of what belief is involved. I think from every which angle, effective both evangelistically as well as edificationally. So, uh, and these are some of the sources. Uh, sure could expand this, but this is just what was on my shelf that I immediately copied down. Um, and uh, I really like uh, Dale Bruner's work because he tends to combine that exegetical technical background with a kind of pastor's heart. Uh, that helps me considerably. Uh, the due diligence works there, Don Carson, Beasley Murray, Raymond Brown. Um, in my first year of teaching, I was in Taiwan. Uh, I wasn't married, uh, lived with rookie Chinese teachers and I was working on my master's for Merle Tenney. Um, Gerald may be the only one in this room that even recognizes that name. Um, and uh, I did three papers toward my master's on the Gospel of John. Um, I wrote them out longhand, sent them back, mailed them back to my girlfriend, who's now my wife. She typed them. And then she brought them into Merle Tenney and explained them to him. Um, Richard Hayes, I think, is a really interesting hermeneutical uh, emphasis on figural Christology. Kent Hughes is a good pastor's type commentary. I'll give you some ideas on how to frame it for a congregation. Leon Morris. Uh, Leslie Newbegin's kind of devotional meditations, uh, The Light Has Come, an exposition of the fourth gospel. That helped me working on those Lenten studies that I did. Well, good. That gives you some idea uh, of one person's approach um, to the Gospel of John. Thoughts, questions, ideas? Thank you for the lecture, Dr. Webster. Um, I really enjoyed the way you talked about trying to weave those literary themes mm -hmm. um, throughout the text. And you mentioned using a larger pericope or passage selection in order to kind of accomplish getting at those themes. Um, are there any other ways that you might suggest that we could weave some of those literary themes in case we didn't want to miss some of the nuances of a smaller passage? Hmm. 
Well, I think that you know there's a real place for focusing in on on the smaller passage. Um, but we've tended to do a lot of that with the small pass. So sometimes it's refreshing, especially for people that have, let's say, gone through the Gospel of John several times, uh, to be exposed to a different view. Like I, I did Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. You could also do Jesus and John the Baptist at the beginning and Jesus and Peter at the end. And there's kind of a chiastic structure the incarnate word and the risen Lord. And you know, I think just thinking that together is, um, is helpful for people that have heard John many, many times. Uh, but it also, I think, works for a new person you know, that has never heard it before. I don't think it uh, makes it more difficult for them. Thank you, Dr. Ultra. Reagan. Um, when you were pastoring, how did you allocate your time to prepare for a sermon? I'm not a good model <laughs> for anything. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I preach March 24. I'm preaching this Sunday, too, and working on that sermon, but I preach March 24th in the three morning services at the Advent, and I started thinking about the text today. I like to, I like to get that text early, and be thinking about it. Um, so I never really wait to the week. I've, uh, I wrote this sermon for Sunday two weeks ago, and then I keep going over it and thinking about it, reflecting on it. Um, OK, my, my schedule Monday was to go to the office because I usually was so brain dead, I might as well be at the office. I wasn't really good for other people. Um, and sort of slowly start my week, see people begin to plan. Tuesday was um, staff time and planning for worship and finalizing the next Sunday. Wednesday, I was stayed at home uh, as a day off, but spent the morning working on the message. And then I would go and exercise with Virginia, and we'd go out to lunch. And that was kind of our Wednesday Sabbath. Um, I remember Andrew, uh, my surfing middle son, uh, leaving to go surf, which was 26 miles away to the beach, uh, and coming back. And I probably was on the same page. He'd been gone hours. Sometimes it was really slow work. Sometimes it worked fast. but. Uh, and then Thursday and Friday, I was into the office. Saturday, I tried to take, I tried to keep myself busy so I wouldn't think about Sunday. I don't know if you can identify with that. Um, I didn't really want to think about Sunday. Preaching uh, affects my whole system. I don't digest well. I don't sleep well. And I've done this now for so many years. Don't you think it would fix itself? But it doesn't. It has the same as my first couple years, I think. Um, Sunday, I'm, I'm always up around 5 or 5.30. Uh, I get into church uh, those days at around 6.30, uh, met with the worship team around 7.30. We prayed, and then we had our first service at 8. So that's kind of my week. I have no hobbies. Um, uh, my kids were probably my hobbies when they were growing up. A uh, family dinner was always sort of uh, really important. Um, I joke that my high schooler teenage children at the time probably wished that their father was less in their lives, not more. Uh, I, you know, I really loved my kids, and uh, so that was sort of my, uh, it was easier really not to be so work-oriented when I had children. They were my distraction. Uh, I have a wife that uh, grew up in the mission field, uh, father, pastor, missionary. She knew the whole regimen. So there was very little adjustment in, uh, in our life together. It just sort of fit, fit well. Thank Dan? you, Dr. Webster. Um, how would you propose preaching through some of the larger stories going on in John? So like John 6 is 71 verses. Um, yeah. You know, right now I'm going through with my youth group the, the I am sayings in the Gospel of John, and so I had to break up John 11 
Lazarus into two sections, and even then, 20-minute sermons aren't really. So how, how would you move through that without dwelling on a sermon for a couple of weeks? Yeah. Well, you know, I would do it really differently than what we talked about this week in the preaching lecture series. I, I would find a key text, a key pericope within that much larger section, and that would be what we would read. And then I would describe aspects. You know, you couldn't do justice to the whole thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, and that's a bit of a struggle. I'm more and more convinced that our preaching should be about 20 minutes. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think we're talking too long, and we're putting too much fuller in it, filler in it. Um, uh, I think we've got to get to the point. Um, that's how I preach. I, I want people, if, they, if I drop dead in the first five minutes, they really got the message. Um, so it's clear. You got it. Um, I could stop talking. Uh, I don't, uh, and that's part of the reflection of my personality. Um, I don't want to build, I want it there. Now, what's next? Uh, idea. So. Thank you, Dr. Webster. You mentioned how John has very specific literary intentions um, and how at times that was for you in conflict with your view of the inerrancy of scripture, like because the gospel writer is not worrying about chronology or things like that. And I uh -huh. think all four of the gospels do that in different ways. Right. And a lot of times some of us are in churches where people have a very high view of the inerrancy of scripture but are not so familiar with like the literary techniques used by the authors. Is that something that you try to address from the pulpit if you think that it might conflict with how people understand scripture or do you just like preach the message and maybe deal with those types of things more in a Sunday school or Bible study type of setting? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the liberal mainline. So it's kind of a break for me. Um, I, I come off saying really conservative and fundamentalist to most of them. Uh, uh, I, I think more implicitly than explicitly would be my angle, I guess, with that. But like what I just said about the temple cleansing is what I would say in a sermon. I would basically say, don't worry about this. This is why John did it this way. And then that might, conversations might happen out of the context of the sermon then on that particular issue. I wouldn't speak of words like inerrancy or, you know, I wouldn't bring those words into that discussion. Um, but I would want to constantly uh, convince people that I find the word of God fully authoritative, completely trustworthy. This is what our whole life and ministry and church is built on, this word. And this is true. And it's rooted in history. Uh, this is how God has spoken. So it would be that kind of rhetoric that would frame those kinds of questions. Yeah, I, would you put like Mary and Thomas in the same boat um, and how Jesus worked both of them to belief? I think is, is a wonderful testimony to, one, the variety of ways in which we need to communicate resurrection hope, resurrection reality. Uh, the highly existential, emotive way of dealing with Mary was a legit way. And the highly empirical touch my hand with Thomas was. So that would imply to me that a message that would zero in on the evidential affirmation of the resurrection is valid. And a highly emotive, convincing, compelling description of the resurrection is also valid. Uh, and I think it'd be helpful to put Mary and Thomas in the same message, actually, too, because I think John does. I'll pray. Lord God, thank you for your gospel. All four parts of it, bearing witness and, and testimony to the truth of your reality. Help us to live into this by the power of your Holy Spirit, to the glory of the Father, and in the name of the Son. Amen.
Yeah. Mm.